As we discussed in one of the introductory lectures, the information contained in seismic data consists of arrival times and amplitude of reflected waves. Our focus in this lecture is learning what the amplitude of reflected waves tell us about the contrast of physical properties which cause the reflection. Zapritz equations for a horizontal interface is one basic way of developing insights of this problem. Some of the key outcomes are familiarizing yourself with the fact that at normal incidence, no shear wave is generated, transmitted, or reflected at the horizontally flat interface. Familiarize yourself with the fact that at the air-water and air-solid interfaces, there are no transmitted waves. We have total reflection. Familiarize yourself with the linearized Sopritz equations and understand the difference between post-critical reflection and pre-critical reflection. We need to introduce three new notions in order to quantify the relationship between amplitude of reflected waves and the contrast of physical properties between rock formations. These new notions are boundary conditions at the interface between two rock formations. P and S wave potentials and plane wave approximation. We will start by defining the boundary conditions between two rock formations for the horizontal interface. Boundary conditions at the solid-solid interface. At this interface, the incident energy is partitioned into two reflections, that is reflected P and S waves and two transmissions or transmitted P and S waves. So we need four boundary conditions to solve this energy partition problem. Let's repeat this due to its importance. At the solid-solid interface, the incident energy is partitioned into two reflections and two transmissions. So we need four boundary conditions to solve this energy partition problem. In seismology, the model of the solid-solid interface that we use is that of two elastic media in welded contact. This means that all components of the displacement field U must be continuous across the interface. Let's repeat this. In seismology, the model of the solid-solid interface that we use is that of two elastic media in welded contact. This means that all components of the displacement field U must be continuous across the interface. In other words, the displacement above the interface is equal to the displacement just below the interface. If the vertical component of displacement were not continuous, one medium would either separate from the other, leaving a vacuum in between, or would penetrate into the other so that the two media would occupy the same space. If the horizontal displacement were not continuous, the two would move differently on opposite sides of the boundary, causing one to slide over the other. Such relative motion is assumed to be impossible. On the interface, according to Newton's third law of motion, the vertical tractions must be continuous across the interface. In other words, the vertical traction above the interface is equal to the vertical traction just below the interface. Here is a reminder that the vertical traction is composed of three stresses, tau xz, tau yz, and tau zz. If this were not so, the infinitesimally small volume with vanishing mass would be acted upon by a finite force and hence have an acceleration that would approach infinity as the two points approached each other. The same reasoning applies to horizontal components of the vertical traction vector. Thus, they must be continuous at the boundary. Boundary conditions at the fluid solid interface. The fluid-solid boundary can represent the seafloor. 
At this interface, the incident energy is partitioned into one reflection, that is, reflected P wave, because fluid does not support S waves, and two transmissions, or transmitted P and S waves. So we need three boundary conditions to solve this energy partition problem. Let's repeat this again due to its importance. At the fluid solid interface, which can represent the seafloor, this interface has the incident energy which is partitioned into one reflection and two transmissions. So we need three boundary conditions to solve this energy partition problem. Due to the allowed slip in the horizontal direction, the horizontal components of motion in the elastic medium in general are unrelated to the horizontal components of fluid motion. These inequations are not boundary conditions. They are not useful in the derivations of Saprit's equations. They are included here because we would like to provide you a comprehensive understanding of changes at the fluid solid interface. Let's repeat this again. Due to the allowed slip in the horizontal direction, the horizontal components of motion in the elastic medium in general are unrelated to the horizontal components of fluid motion. These inequations are not boundary conditions. They are not useful in the derivations of Zapritz equations. They are included here because we would like to provide you with a comprehensive understanding of changes at the fluid solid interface. The vertical traction vector at the interface is continuous. Note again that the shear stresses are zero in the fluid. We use the scalar pressure field description of wave propagation in the fluid. Finally, Consider the interface at depth Z being between air and solid, that is, a free surface. On the free surface, the tractions are continuous, since an infinite acceleration would be required to maintain a traction discontinuity. Inasmuch as a vacuum cannot sustain any stress, we get the free surface boundary condition. Vertical traction is zero, is equal to zero vector. Boundary conditions at the fluid fluid interface. At this interface, the incident energy is partitioned into one reflection, that is, reflected P wave, because fluid does not support S waves, and one transmission, or transmitted P wave. So we need two boundary conditions to solve this energy partition problem. Let me repeat this once again. At the fluid-fluid interface, the incident energy is partitioned into one reflection and one transmission. So we need two boundary conditions to solve this energy partition problem. The vertical component of the particle displacement and pressure are continuous as you can see here. It is assumed that the horizontal component of the displacement may be discontinuous. That is, in the horizontal plane, the two fluids may slip relative to each other. No pressure can be exerted from the vacuum side or air of the interface. Continuity of pressure implies that the surface is pressure free. That is, PZ is equal to zero. Such an interface is called a free surface. Let's now talk about the P wave and S wave potentials. These potentials play a central role in the derivation of the reflection and transmission coefficients. Scalar and vector potentials allow us to decompose the particle displacement into P and S waves and therefore to quantify separately the reflected P wave and reflected S wave in relation with the contrast of physical properties of rock formations. That is why here we recall the definitions of scalar and vector potentials. As described in one of the previous lectures, 
the decomposition of particle displacement into scalar and vector potentials is known as Helmholtz decomposition. The Helmholtz decomposition of a vector field states that any arbitrary vector field can in general be represented as a sum of curl-free and divergence-free forms. The Helmholtz decomposition of the elastic displacement field is given as the gradient of the scalar potential plus the curl of the vector potential, where chi is the scalar potential, also known as P-wave potential or dilatational displacement potential, and where psi is the vector potential, also known as S-wave potential or rotational displacement potential. We can verify that chi describes P waves by showing the divergence of the particle displacement, that is, volumetric change, which depends only on chi, whereas the curl of the particle displacement, that is, the change of shape, is independent of chi. Similarly, we can verify that psi describes S waves by showing the curl of the particle displacement, that is, the change of shape, which depends only on psi, whereas the divergence of the particle displacement, that is, volumetric change, is independent of psi. Scalar and vector potentials. When we substitute the Helmholtz decomposition into the elastodynamic equation, we obtain the following. A solution exists if these two equations hold. By substituting the Helmholtz decomposition into the elastodynamic wave equation, we show in the previous lecture that scalar, or P wave potential, and vector, or S wave potential, are well separated in two terms in this equation. A solution exists if each term is zero. These two equations are described here as two wave equations. Here we have relationships between the Lemay potentials and the displacement. These relationships are important as they are used in derivations of Saprit's equation. Now we introduce the plane wave approximation, which we will also use in the derivation of Saprit's equation. When we consider the propagation of waves at great distances from their sources, it is obvious that the initial curved wave front tends to become plane as the wave travels outward. The initial curvature thus becomes very small. The wave fronts may for practical purposes be considered as plane. In the far field, we should expect that plane wave theory is an adequate approximation of the exact theory. We will see that dealing with the propagation of elastic waves using plane wave theory gives us a useful procedure for analyzing amplitude of reflected and transmitted waves. Wave propagation in elastic isotropic media with planar interfaces can be examined with great ease by using plane waves. In particular, we will use the plane wave representation together with the boundary conditions at elastic interfaces to derive plane wave reflection and transmission coefficients. A 3D plane displacement wave propagating with phase velocity v is represented by this simple formula in blue, where u0 and n are unit vectors defining the directions of motion that is, polarization and propagation respectively, and x denotes the position vector. It is a solution of the wave equation above it. Note that the scalar product of the position vector and the direction of propagation is the equation of a plane normal to the unit propagation vector n. Thus, this equation represents a traveling plane wave with velocity v and planes of constant phase whose normals are n. Here are the descriptions of P wave, SV wave, and SH wave 
based on the direction of propagation and particle motion. For P waves, the motion vector U0 of the P wave is parallel to the direction of propagation N. For S waves, the motion vector U0 of the S wave is not parallel to the direction of propagation N. The motion vector U0 describes the polarization of the shear wave. Again, here is the formula of a 3D plane displacement wave propagating with phase velocity v. For mathematical convenience, we generally use a complex exponential function instead of the arbitrary function f. A plane harmonic displacement wave propagating with phase velocity v in a direction defined by the unit propagation vector n. It is understood that the physical displacement components are the real part of u. This is a special case of a time harmonic, monochromatic displacement wave. The amplitude A is independent of the particle position and time. Here we have relationships between the Lamaze potential and the displacement. These relationships will be used later to derive plane wave expressions from the Lamay potentials, that is, P and S wave potentials. In the previous slides, the Helmholtz decomposition of the displacement vector was reintroduced. In particular, equations describing relationships between the Lamay potentials and the displacement. Note that we use one of these relationships here to derive plane wave expression for the P wave potential by substituting the plane solution in this relationship. Because the directions of propagation and motion are parallel, that is, the scalar product of u0 and n equals to 1, it allows us to obtain the simple expression in blue here. Note that we have applied two partial time integrations to arrive at this expression. Again, in the previous slides, the Helmholtz decomposition of the displacement vector was reintroduced. In particular, equations describing relationships between the Lamay potentials and the displacement. Note that we use one of these relationships here to derive plane wave expression for the S wave potential by substituting the plane solution in this relationship. For SV waves, where directions of propagation and motion are both in the XZ plane, only psi y is non-zero. We obtain the simple expression in blue here. Note that we have applied two partial time integrations to arrive at this expression. In summary, we will assume that waves arriving at the interface can be treated the same as plane waves. One problem associated with plane wave approximation, however, is that it leads us to neglect the effects of geometric spreading associated with spherical waves. For this reason, normal practice suggests correcting seismic data for geometric spreading effects before applying Zapritz equation to the analysis of data. Now that we have developed the necessary background, it is time to talk about reflection and transmission coefficients. Consider in the XZ plane the propagation of a traveling incident plane P wave of amplitude AI, which equals one or a traveling incident plane SV wave of amplitude BI, which equals one, characterized by the P wave and S wave displacement potentials. If the incident wave is a pure P wave, then we're using the figure on your left in light green. If it is a pure SV wave, then we are using the figure on your right in light blue. Let's focus on the left in the light green picture. Our approach here applies also to the picture on the right. 
The amplitudes of the displacement of the reflected and transmitted P waves are then by definition called reflection coefficient, RPP, and transmission coefficient, TPP. The PSV reflection and transmission are by definition the reflection coefficient, RPS, and the transmission coefficient, TPS. We use the same definition for angles as in the previous lecture. The incident angle is theta i, theta r, and theta t. Denote angles of reflected and transmitted P wave rays. The angles of converted reflected and transmitted S wave rays are denoted by phi r and phi t respectively. Here is the descriptions P and S waves. The minus signs in the phase of the reflected potentials indicate that wave propagation is in the direction of the negative z axis. Note that we have omitted the factor exponents minus i omega t because it will cancel out when we substitute the potentials into the boundary conditions. Note also that this description of p and s waves separately is only possible because we introduce p and s wave potentials. The derivations of Zapritz equations consist of substituting these potentials in the boundary conditions. Let me repeat this important information. Here is the descriptions of P and S waves. The minus signs in the phase of the reflected potentials indicate that wave propagation is in the direction of the negative z axis. Note that we have omitted the factor exponents minus i omega t because it will cancel out when we substitute the potentials into the boundary conditions. Note also that this description of P and S waves separately is only possible because we introduce P and S wave potentials. The derivations of Zapritz equations consist of substituting these potentials in the boundary conditions. Remember that the boundary conditions are described in terms of particle displacement and stresses, whereas the reflection and transmission coefficients are described in terms of potentials. To obtain the reflection and transmission coefficients, we write out the components of displacement and the components of stress in terms of wave potentials for P waves and SV waves in the XZ plane. So let's start with the boundary condition, which states that the horizontal component of displacement is continuous across the interface. The second is about the continuity of the vertical component of displacement. The third condition is about the continuity of the vertical component of vertical traction. The fourth condition is about the continuity of the horizontal component of vertical traction. By substituting potentials of plane waves defined in the previous slides, into these boundary conditions, we obtain the Zapritz equations. So we have four equations which constitute Zapritz equations. That is, a system of equations for the reflection and transmission coefficients, RPP, RPS, TPP, and TPS. Here is the matrix notation of this system. This system of equations can be solved numerically on a computer for each set of parameters. Please see the computer exercises. Here are the coefficients of Zapritz equation. W1 is the S wave impedance of the top half space. W2 is the S wave impedance of the bottom half space. Z1 is the P wave impedance of the top half space. Z2 is the P wave impedance of the bottom half space. Vs1 is the S wave velocity of the top half space. Vs2 is the S wave velocity 
of the bottom half space. VP1 is the P wave velocity of the top half space. VP2 is the P wave velocity of the bottom half space. Now it's time for a quiz. Let's start with our first question. In some special cases, such as normal incidence in fluid fluid half spaces, reflection and transmission coefficients can be obtained analytically. Determine these coefficients for these cases. Here is your answer. For normal incidence, that is, theta incident is equal to zero. The force of Pritz equations reduced to two equations, which involves RPP and TPP only, as you can see here. So, at the particular case of normal incidence, that is, the incident angle is zero degrees, so Pritz equations reduced to RPP equals to the differences of P wave impedance of the two rock formations, divided by the sum and TPP equals to twice the P wave impedance of the top half space, divided by the sum of impedances. Note that RPS and TPS are zero. In other words, the most converted coefficients are zero. This result follows also from the fact that there are no shearing stresses at normal incidence. Thus, a normally incident P wave produces only reflected and transmitted P waves. These relationships are useful when we want to analyze the behavior of P waves propagating through layer cake media at nearly normal incidence. Here's the second quiz. In our first question, we have, in some special cases, such as non-normal incidence and fluid-fluid half spaces, Reflection and transmission coefficients can be obtained analytically. Determine these coefficients for these cases. Our second question is to determine the reflection coefficient at the air-water interface. Here are your answers. When the S-wave velocities are zero, the four Sopritz equations reduce to two equations which involves RPP and TPP only, as you can see here. So when the S wave velocities are zero, we can deduce from the Zapritz equations the following reflection and transmission coefficients for a fluid-fluid boundary. Note that we have only two coefficients and two boundary conditions in this case, as discussed earlier. At air-water interface, we have a free surface. Therefore, we have total reflection and no transmission. In other words, RPP is plus or minus one and TPP is zero. This concludes the answers to the second quiz. Let's look at some examples of numerical solutions for Sopritz equations in solid-solid cases. In example one, the figure shows the reflection and transmission coefficients in terms of amplitude ratios, that is, RPP, RPS, TPP, and TPS, for a case in which P wave velocity of the bottom half over the P wave velocity of the top half space is 2.5 and the density of the bottom half space over the density of the top half space is 1.22. Poisson's ratio, velocity equals 0.25, is identical for the two half spaces. These plots show several interesting points. At normal incidence, no shear waves are generated. The P wave reflection and transmission coefficients are almost equal, where RPP almost equals 0.5, and TPP is about 
No compressional energy enters the bottom half space at angles beyond the first critical angle, theta IC, which is 24 degrees. No shear energy enters the bottom half space at an angle beyond the second critical angle, here denoted as theta IS, which is 44 degrees. Three angles have almost total P wave reflection. The first critical angle, that is, theta equals 24 degrees. The second critical angle, that is, theta equals 44 degrees. And the third critical angle, that is, theta equals 90 degrees. Two angles have almost total reflection as shear. The second critical angle, that is, theta equals 44 degrees and theta equals 70 degrees. The compressional reflection amplitude is very small at about 35 degrees and no converted shear reflection occurs at 24 degrees, 44 degrees, or 90 degrees. No shear energy enters the bottom half space at an angle beyond the second critical angle, which is 44 degrees. The reflection and transmission coefficients can be negative. Example 2. A second series of reflection and transmission coefficients is shown here for a case in which VP2 over VP1 equals 2 and density 2 over density 1 equals 0 0.5. Poisson's ratio, where velocity equals 0 0.25, is identical for the two half spaces. Note that the PP reflection can be null at normal incidence. As no shear waves are generated at normal incidence, most of the energy is transmitted P wave at low incident angles. Other remarks that we can make are that one, at high angles of incidence, most of the energy is the reflected P wave. Two, the transmitted P wave and the transmitted S wave disappear at the critical angle. And three, the energy of reflected S waves is generally low away from the critical angle compared to reflected P waves. So these S waves are likely to be difficult to identify in seismic reflection data. Example 3. A third series of reflection and transmission coefficients is shown here for a case in which VP2 over VP1 equals 0 0.5. Density 2 over density 1 equals 0 0.8. Poisson's ratio, where velocity equals 0 0.25, is identical for the two half spaces. Here, the curves are less complicated than those in previous two examples, mainly because no critical angle exists in this case. The S wave velocity and P wave velocity in the bottom half space are less than the P wave velocity in the top half space. Here are some take home points. At normal incidence, that is, theta i equals zero degrees, no shear wave is generated, transmitted, or reflected. At the first critical angle, TPP equals zero. No P wave energy enters the lower half space at angles beyond the first critical angle. At the second critical angle, TPS equals zero after the second critical angle. No S wave energy enters the lower half space at angles beyond the second critical angle. The variations of RPP are very smooth and small before the first critical angle. 
Let's now conclude this lecture by describing a way of simplifying Saprit's equations. This simplification is based on linearization. Saprit's equations allow us to predict the variations of reflection coefficients with angle for a given set of contrasts of elastic parameters. We have access to reflection coefficients through the amplitude of seismic data and angle through offsets, or source receiver distances. The challenge is to reconstruct the contrasts of elastic parameters which allow us to characterize subsurface. Zapritz equations have a complicated dependence upon the elastic parameters of the two media, as well as the angle of incidence. However, these equations can be simplified by linearization and therefore facilitate the reconstruction of the contrast of elastic parameters. Linearization here corresponds to assuming that the changes in elastic parameters are small across the interface between the half spaces. Linearized formulae in reflection coefficients are as follows. RPP equals APP plus BPP sine squared theta I. RPS prime equals APS plus BPS sine squared theta I. RPS prime equals RPS over sine theta I for theta I is greater than zero. APP and APS are called the intercepts, and BPP and BPS are called gradients. Here are linearized reflection coefficients, which are the dotted lines, and the exact solution computed directly from the Saprit's equations, which are the solid lines, for two models. One model yields critical angles, whereas the other one does not yield any critical angle we can see that the linear approximation tracks the exact solution quite well up to the near critical angle before it breaks down. For the model without critical angles, the linear approximations still break down, although at a later angle, approximately 35 degrees, actually the limits of validity that we have observed for these two models are quite general. In fact, these linearized approximations are valid only for pre-critical data, that is, before the incident angle reaches the critical region, or up to 35 degrees if the first critical angle occurs later than 35 degrees. Let's confirm that this behavior is noticeable on the exact formulae. Here is the exact RPP in blue lines, which are described as a function of sine squared theta i, and the approximation in black lines for several models. We can see linear behavior in the interval between sine squared theta i, which equals zero, and sine squared theta i, which equals 0 0.4. We also see that at a small angle, the approximations are valid and follow a linear trend here is the exact RPS shown in the red lines as a function of sine squared theta i and the approximation shown in the black lines for several models, that is, several gradients and intercepts. We can also see linear behavior in the interval between sine squared theta i between 0 and 0 0.4. Again, we see that at a small angle, the approximations are valid and follow a linear trend. No other reflector within the Earth has a reflection coefficient like that of the free surface. In places where basement rocks are exposed on the seafloor, the reflection coefficient of the seafloor can be as much as positive 0.8. This situation, typified by offshore eastern Canada, makes seismic data processing very difficult, or the hard bottom problem. 
much of the outgoing seismic energy is trapped in the water layer. In places where active deposition is occurring on the seafloor, the reflection coefficient of the seafloor is typically positive 0.3 and is in large part due to the contrast in density. Strong reflections usually indicate a marked contrast of rock type. Thus, the interface between a marine shell and a hard tight limestone can have a reflection coefficient as high as positive 0.3. However, there are usually not many such reflectors in the geologic column. One particularly anomalous rock is coal. A shallow coal interface can have a reflection coefficient of minus 0.5, due in large part by the contrast in density between shallow and coal. A similar reflection coefficient, but positive, can occur at the top of the tertiary sill. Most of the contribution, but not all, is due to the contrast in velocity. The low density of salt can produce unusual effects. Thus, the interface between soft shell and salt can be weakly positive, whereas that between hard shell and salt can be weakly negative. In between, of course, the reflection coefficient can be zero. The velocity increases across the interface, but the density decreases. The reflection coefficient at the top of a porous gas saturated reservoir sand is almost always negative. For a given cap rock, the reflection strength is a coarse measure of the porosity. The reflection coefficient of a gas water contact is always positive. The reflection coefficient of an oil water contact is also positive, but it is very small. Thank you. Remember there is a large selection of iMode education lectures, which can further enhance your knowledge of wave propagation, elasticity, electromagnetism, wave field sampling, wave field decomposition, and imaging. Thank you for listening to this iMode education lecture.